Hello, I'm Joe Davich, Executive Director of the Georgia Center for the Book, an affiliate of the Library of Congress. The Centers for the Book help carry out the mission of the National Center, which is to promote books, reading, libraries, and literacy nationwide. We also promote our state's literary heritage by putting a focus on books and authors with a connection to our states and territories. Every year, as part of our participation in the Library of Congress National Book Festival, each affiliate center chooses a book for young readers with a local connection as part of the Roadmap to Reading Great Reads from Great Places initiative. You can find more about that reading program at read.gov. Today, we are speaking with authors from Region 2 East, which includes states and territories from the Mason-Dixon Line and the misty Blue Ridge Mountains to the azure blue waters of the Caribbean Sea. Our guests today are invited by affiliate centers for the book from Maryland, North Carolina, Puerto Rico, South Carolina, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Virginia, and the great state of Georgia. Now let's take a moment to meet our authors. Our selection from Maryland, the old line state, is I, Matthew Henson, Polar Explorer, by Carol Boston Weatherford. Baltimore born and raised, Carol composed her first poem in the first grade and dedicated the verse to her mother on the car ride home from school. Her father, a high school printing teacher, printed some of her early poems on index cards. Carol's books have received numerous honors, including three Caldecott honors, two NAACP Image Awards, a SCBWI Golden Kite Award, and a Coretta Scott King Author Honor. Carol received the Reagan Rubin Award from the North Carolina English Teachers Association and the North Carolina Literature Award, among the highest state civilian honors. She is the mother of the mother-son author illustrator duo, Carol and Jeffrey Boston Weatherford, and currently is a professor of English at Fayetteville State University in North Carolina. From the Tar Heel State, the North Carolina selection is How to Steal a Dog by Barbara O'Connor. Barbara is the author of award-winning novels for children, including Wonderland, How to Steal a Dog, and the New York Times bestseller, Wish. Drawing on her South Carolina roots, Barbara's books are known for their strong Southern settings and quirky characters. In addition to Seventh Parents' Choice Awards, Barbara's distinctions include School Library Journal Best Books, Kirkus Best Books, Bank Street College Best Books, American Booksellers Association Best Books, and ALA Notables. Her books have been nominated for Children's Choice Awards in 38 states and have been voted the winner by children in 10. Barbara is a popular visiting author at schools and a frequent speaker at conferences across the country. Now from land to the sea and to the island of enchantment, Puerto Rico, represented by Anika Adamui Denise and her book, Planting Stories, The Life of Librarian and Storyteller, Pura del Pre. Award-winning author Anika Adamui Denise writes stories that tickle her funny bone, tug at her heartstrings, feed her curiosity, and celebrate her multicultural heritage. She's the author of 10 picture books, including the Pura del Pre honor-winning Planting Stories, The Life of Librarian and Storyteller, Pura del Pre, and A Girl Named Rosita, the story of Rita Moreno, actor, singer, dancer, trailblazer. Raised in Queens, New York, she now lives with her husband and three daughters in Rhode Island. Next, we travel to the Low Country and the Palmetto State, South Carolina, to hear from Mary Alice Monroe, the author of the South Carolina selection, The Islanders. Mary Alice is the New York Times bestselling author of 27 books, including The Summer of the Lost and Found, the 2021 installment of her beloved Beach House series. Monroe is also a published children's book author and the environmental themes for which she is known are woven through her adult and children's novels. Monroe's middle grade series written with Angela May the Islanders debuted at number two on the New York Times bestseller list. Mary Alice's many honors include the South Carolina Academy of Honors, Authors Hall of Fame, the Southwest Florida Author of Distinction Award, the South Carolina Award for Literary Excellence, and the prestigious Southern Book Prize for Fiction. She is the co-creator of the weekly web show and podcast, Friends in Fiction, and nearly 8 million copies of her books have been published worldwide. From the American Paradise, the U.S. Virgin Islands, comes their selection, James and the Fireburn, by Angela Golden Bryan. 
Angela Golden Bryan grew up on the beautiful island of San Croix and recognized her love for storytelling at an early age. Throughout her life, she has been drawn to the art of storytelling in various ways. Angela recited poetry to audiences in an elementary school, acted on stage throughout high school, college, and the Navy, acted in television and film as an adult, and now authors award-winning books and produces films. Angela is the founder and executive director of the Fireburn Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to passionately honor the proud Virgin Islands heritage, celebrate its unique culture, and empower future generations by providing educational and artistic tools, resources, collaborative support, and inspiration. Angela was named a Woman of Distinction by the United Nations Association of Broward County in 2022. And in 2021, her nonprofit was honored for its support of the life saving work of the United Nations. She has a master's degree in counseling psychology from the Shaminad University of Honolulu and a master's degree in the practical theology from Wesley Seminary. Angela is a proud military veteran and received a Navy Commendation Medal for saving a person's life. Next, we travel to the Old Dominion the mother of presidents, Virginia, to hear from Sylvia Liu, author of Manatee's Best Friend. Sylvia is the author of middle grade novels and picture books and is a former environmental attorney who is inspired by ocean, kraken, and cephalopods. Sylvia grew up in Caracas, Venezuela and went to Yale College and Harvard Law School. For over a decade, she protected the oceans at the US Department of Justice and the nonprofit group Oceana. The author of Hannah Sue, and the Ghost Crab Nation and Morning with Grandpa, illustrated by Christina Forche. Her art was exhibited at the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art, New Waves in 2021, and she contributed art and infographics to the Huffington Post, Oceana, and the World Wildlife Fund. She co-founded KidLit 411, a resource website for children's writers and illustrators. And finally, from the Empire State of the South, the Peach State, the great state of Georgia, we have Brianna J. McDaniel and her book, Impossible Moon. Brianna J. McDaniel is the author of Hands Up in Impossible Moon. She also provided the text for Atlanta, My Home, commissioned by Atlanta's Alliance Theater and illustrated by Georgia author, illustrator, and six-time Coretta Scott King author honor recipient, R. Gregory Christie. She holds a master's in the arts degree in children's literature from Simmons College and is currently pursuing her PhD at Cambridge University, where her research focuses on representation of black children in contemporary picture books. McDaniel is from Atlanta, Georgia, where she grew up in College Park in East Point. Hands Up was selected as a book all young Georgians should read by the Georgia Center for the Book in 2019. We've asked these authors to think about the theme of this year's festival, Books Bring Us Together and what that means to them and how these stories, inspired by history, families and friendships, and dreaming big, bring us together with universal themes. Now let's hear from each of our authors. First, let's take a look at the books inspired by historical figures and events with Carol, Anika, and Angela. Ladies, how do your books connect to your state and territory and what inspired you to write about this particular piece of history? Let's start our conversation with Carol. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be uh, participating and honored that I, Matthew Henson, Polar Explorer, is going to be one of the featured books at the National Book Festival. I, Matthew Henson, takes readers on an Arctic journey with the Black Maryland-born explorer who made the first successful expedition to the North Pole. From boyhood, Matthew Henson's dreams had sails, like so many young boys and girls' dreams. But those dreams took him from the port of Baltimore and onto the sea and around the world. He began as a cabin boy on the ship of Robert Perry, but he quickly proved himself as an explorer. After decades of determination in the face of danger, Henson was part of a crew, one man, one, I mean, one white man, one black man, and four Inuit men who finally did what no one had ever done before. They made it to the North Pole. I, Matthew Henson is a biography in verse and my third collaboration with award-winning illustrator, 
Eric Velasquez. I tell his story in first person uh, through poetic vignettes, each introduced by a negative statement to convey his resolve to rise above the ordinary, even in the face of adversity. He did all of this during the Jim Crow era. Uh, I wanna read to you just a brief uh, passage. I had not stuck by Perry for decades, sharing the same goal, only to reach a fork when our journey was on its last leg. To achieve their shared goal, Henson battled racism and the harsh polar climate. In researching I, Matthew Henson, I noted the bond between, Hen between Henson and the Inuit people. He learned their language and joined them for songs around the campfire, but he did not buy into their superstitions. Young readers though, are spellbound by the specter of an evil spirit in Henson's story. And it reads, I did not befriend the Inuit, learn to build a sledge, handle a dog team, track and hunt on ice and kill a polar bear to let an Eskimo legend freeze me with fear. Kokoya, the devil of the North guards the ice cap, the Inuit warned. Bad luck from ice flows and food shortages to frostbite dogged Henson and Perry throughout their travails, but they did prevail. And as they posed at the pole, Henson notes, a photo froze our feet in time, but we had not come for photos. We came to plant our flag and Kokoya was nowhere in sight. Books uh, have brought me um, joy throughout my life. And as a child, they were an opportunity for uh, an intimate moment, quality time with my parents. And I shared that same kind of quality time with books uh, with my children. And universal themes such as overcoming adversity are themes that all children can identify with. So I thank you again for uh, featuring I, Matthew Henson. Thank you so much, Carol. And now, Anika, why don't you tell us about your book? Well, first I wanna say thank you. I'm also so happy to be here and um, so proud. And I wanna especially thank um, the Puerto Rico Center for the Book for choosing Planting Stories as their selection. I, as a New Yorkian who grew up in the diaspora, I can think of no greater honor and thrill that this a book of mine was chosen to represent um, an island that I always felt a little bit distant from, but longed for and wanted to be connected to. Um, later in life, as I got to travel there more, um, I always felt that, uh, that a part of me that was missing was reconnected. And so this moment is um, incredibly special. The book I wrote, Planting Stories, The Life of Librarian and Storyteller Pura Belpre, is a picture book biography about Pura Belpre, who was a prolific author and a gifted bilingual storyteller who wrote and reinterpreted Puerto Rican folk tales. She was the first Latina librarian in the New York public library system, where she pioneered the library's work with the Puerto Rican community. She was not just an author and a storyteller. She was an activist and a connector. She did the thing that we are all doing now, being here, which is to spark a love of reading. She of course was especially connected to the Spanish speaking community in the neighborhoods, in the libraries she served. But most importantly, she was a preserver and a promoter of literature that all children could see themselves in. She was doing this a hundred years ago and um, her presence is felt in every children's room and every place where they work with puppets and do bilingual storytelling and every library branch, not just in New York, but in the world. And um, I was incredibly um, excited to be able to research more about her. I grew up hearing her stories, but was also, um, all, in the research that I did, I was also discovering Bura really for the first time. And her impact is something that I connect to, not just as um, 
an author, but also as um, a little Puerto Rican child who sat with her book, Perez y Martina, if you can see that, um, took it out from the library and for the first time saw myself on the page. So thank you so much for having me and um, I'm excited to hear from all the other authors that I'm sharing space with tonight. Thank you so much, Anika. And now let's hear from Angela. Could you please tell us a little bit about Jane and the Fireburn and what the Fireburn is? Absolutely, thank you so much, Joe. And I, I echo the sentiments of the other authors that it is such an honor to be here, uh, to have my, my book be a part of this illustrious event. And in the presence of such amazing women, <laughs> this, is a, this is amazing, so thank you. I'll start with books bring us together. Books bring us, bring us together for memory creating, for bonding, for healing, for cultural preservation. And that's really what James and the Fireburn is about. It, it morphed for me. We'll start with the Fireburn. It's an event, a pivotal event in the history of the US Virgin Islands that took place in post-emancipation uh, Virgin Islands in 1878. And during that time, the laborers did not have the freedom, although they were no longer enslaved, they did not have the freedom to go from one plantation and work without the permission of the landowners. They could not go from one island to the next. They, they really did not have freedom. So they were supposedly free, but they were not. Every October 1st was known as contract day. And on that day, they were supposedly able to renegotiate their contra contracts. And yes, you can move to a state whim. You can go to, over to St. Thomas. However, every year they were disappointed. And finally, in 1878, they were sick and tired of being sick and tired. And on this day, a revolt took place. And that is, I, I take this very real event and I put it into a rhyming verse in James and the Fireburn so that children can understand that this is a part of what happened. They can understand how it was resolved. And also what I did is I paralleled it to bullying, which devastated our family. So it's a very, very personal story. I take James who was being bullied and in history class, Miss Lou tells the story of the fire burn. And she says, wow, you know, this is human rights violations. They were being bullied, but someone stood up and she then encourages others to stand up. What will you do? At lunchtime, they, someone stands up for James and he gets these friends. So I end it with, you know, can't we all love one another regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of, of anything. And that's basically the story of the fire burn I was moved to write James and the Fireburn because my ancestors were involved in that event. My great great grandmother Mariah, she was a teenager at the time, and her job was to to hide the children. And that inspired me because so often when people look at history, it's like, oh, we want to be related to the royalty, to the queen, to the this. But what about the babysitter? What about the, the, the common folks? We're all related to someone. And so it's, it's a tale to show that everyone has a part to play and it makes a huge difference regardless of what it is. So that's James and the Fireburn, anti-bullying, human rights, and let's just, let's come together and let's support one another. Thank you so very much, Angela. That was very, very moving. Thank you. Now Let's discuss the role family plays in some of your books. Although one is for young readers and one is for middle grade readers, it seems that elders, in particular grandmothers, play a large role in steering the course of two particular stories by Brianna and Mary Alice. So Brianna, let's start by talking about Impossible Moon. So I just want to say before I start, I am so excited for this opportunity. Um, this is the second opportunity that I'm getting to kind of show how much I love Atlanta and how much I love Georgia. 
And um, I just, I honestly can't believe this is happening. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm glad to be here and thank you all for, happen, uh, for having me. Um, so my grandmother was one of my best friends and not just my grandmother, but I got a lot of um, opportunities to travel with her when I was um, in a, a little bit older in high school and then starting out in college. And she was, um, she went to the Grady Nursing School when they had a nursing school in downtown Atlanta. And I would go to her to these caucuses and I fell in love with all of these women um, who were her friends that had these amazing stories about all the different things that the that they had done, the adventures that they had. One time, my auntie Anne was talking about the singer that they had seen and how, you know, she was cute. And um, I asked who the singer was, and she said Ella Fitzgerald. <laughs> I was like, that, okay, <laughs> Ella Fitzgerald was cute. Um, and so being able to spend all that time with my grandmother and also hearing the stories that she and her friends shared with me made me realize that there was so much that I was missing out on um, when I was younger and didn't want to sit down and listen to stories. I uh, wanted to run and play, wanted to run and play video games, wanted to read, you know, um, books, but wasn't too invested in the stories that existed in the people around me. Um, and so with Impossible Moon, uh, the grana in the book, who is based on my grana, um, her stories are what really fuel, jet fuel, if you will, um, Mabel's ideas and these this opportunity she has to shoot for the moon and hope that um, if she touches the moon, it could change things for her grandmother. So, I mean... <laughs> I think that they're critical. Um, I would say too that she's the grandmother is not the only elder in the book. If you look at the constellations that are later in the book, um, you'll see that Aquarius, the constellation Aquarius is there. Um, and he is a gardener and he's watering his heavenly garden, his celestial garden. Um and then you have the Pleiades, the seven sisters, who are the seven sisters in my book. And um, they were, when I was writing this story and I thought about the support that I've gotten to get through a lot of the challenges that have, ex have existed for me um, professionally in other spaces, my grandmother was one of those people, but also the music that I grew up with that my mom made sure, you know, we were listening to. Um, and one of the really uh, important um, groups that she introduced me and my sisters to was Sweet Honey and the Rock. And so imagining uh, what these sisters would look like, I imagined how they carried me with their music through my PhD, through um, you know, heartbreaks and losses. Um, and so it just made sense that when this character thought all hope was lost, the sisters that would carry her, the elders that would carry her, the ancient ones, the stars would be um, Sweet Honey and the Rock. So those were the ideas that were going through my head. Um, and it was really important for me to have those guiding lights that were the Grana um, the, in the other constellations, including the sisters, seven sisters. Yes, well, thank you so much, Brianna. Brianna, let's, let's hear a little bit about the Islanders. Ah, uh, the Islanders. Well, I have to say this is truly, first of all, is a great honor, like everyone else said. I'd written for adults for many years, for 20 years. I've tried to bring the adult reader to the natural world. So it's really a thrill at this point in my career to be talking and writing for middle grade students. These are This is the future. You know, I want to inspire these kids to get outside and to, to be creative outside and unplug. And that was the why of the writing for this book. I wrote it with Angela May and together we both love our South Carolina state from the coast to the marshlands to the mountains. 
And we chose an island, an actual place called Deweese Island, which is right off Isle of Palms on the, Isle of Palms on the coast. And that's where I live. And it's accessible only by ferry. And we wanted to put three children who were different in gender, economic status, race, and put them on this island where there were no cars, no stores, and for these children, no internet. The grandmother is the tentpole figure. She's the one who welcomes Jake, this 11-year-old boy, to the island. And she doesn't believe in the internet. So Jake is, oh my gosh, this is going to be the worst summer ever. He just can't believe he's stuck on an island with his grandmother with no internet. And he doesn't know what to do outside. We wanted to put the children in an environment, especially post-COVID, where they were outdoors. I think everyone is concerned about how plugged in our kids are. So we wanted to show them how fun it was to unplug or less screen time, more green time. So we put them, this one boy who, again, is a bit recalcitrant about being there in the first place. And his grandmother guides him to go out, out to explore, to create a journal, to record what he sees. She's a bit old school. She has a library of books and she shows them how to identify what these critters are and the birds that they find. And he meets two friends. And I wanted to show that you don't need a lot of friends in the middle grade. It's a tough time in your life. You need one good friend and you're lucky if you have two. And as chance would have it, he meets Macon from Atlanta, by the way, and he meets Lovey, who's a local girl, kind of a Hermione Granger kind of a girl. She knows it all. She grew up in the low country. She's the one who can ride the boat. And these three children, over the course of a summer, they get into trouble. They learn all about sea turtles. I always bring in some species in my books. But the main thing they discover is how important good friends are what it means to be a good friend, what honesty is, to learn the names of what is wild around them. Because when they know the names of what is outside, they're no longer afraid. I wanted kids to read the book, to be in the wild with them and to realize that when you know what's safe and what's not safe, what's wild becomes your own backyard. So that was the why of why we wrote this book. And it's a series. We have a sequel, The Search for Treasure, where I really wanted to focus on alligators, which, you know, all along the Southeast, those poor critters are in trouble. And they have these wild adventures again, but each, each book in this series, the children grow up a little bit more. The relationships with the adults around them are fraught with some issues. We don't shy away from important familial issues in the book. So I don't think middle grade children are surprised by almost anything that happens in the real world. It's how we handle it, as we all know on this panel. We all know it's language and it's the innocence of children that we're mindful of. But the issues still are very strong. So the why of the book, the why of the whole series, to get our kids outdoors, less green time, more green time, and by modeling what is fun outside. So I'm so thrilled. I think the book is probably the right book at the right time, given post-COVID. And I'm really pleased that the children are catching on to wanting to get outdoors. They're writing journals. We're getting a lot of letters. So it's a thrill at this point in my career to be writing for this wonderful age group. And I thank you for including my book. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mary Alice. Well, you alluded to, of course, um, trouble and problems. So let's take a minute to bring in our author from North Carolina as well and talk about choices youngsters make and choices imposed on them by circumstances. You know, these themes are both particular to the Islanders and How to Steal a Dog uh, by Barbara O'Connor. So Barbara, let's start with you for this one. 
All right. Uh, first of all, of course, I have to agree with all the others um, about what a wonderful honor it is. Um, I'm so happy to be back in North Carolina. I spent a lot, most of my childhood in the South, but I moved way up to Yankee land in Boston for a lot of years, but I'm glad to be back. Um, so I had still a dog. Uh, this sounds kind of crazy probably, but all my books start literally and figuratively with the first sentence. A sentence pops into my head. And most of the time, I don't even know what the story is. I just have a sentence. Um, and the first sentence of How to Steal a Dog is, the day I decided to steal a dog is the same day my best friend, Luann Godfrey, found out I lived in a car. I didn't know she was going to live in a car, but that's the way she appeared to me. Um, so I, then I took it from there. The story is about um, a girl named Georgina, fifth grader. Uh, she has a brother, Toby, in the third grade. And her father has abandoned the family, just left. Uh, I don't say why he left. And it drives kids crazy. They're always writing me or you know, talking to me in schools. Why did the father leave? So we get, get to have a good conversation about why a parent might leave the family. Um, and obviously, it is a broken family. And the mother can't afford to stay in the apartment that they had, so they ultimately live, uh, end up living in their car. Um, the kids, you know, first of all, um, I'm often asked, have I ever been homeless? And thankfully, I never have. But uh, I did do research on rural homelessness. Um, for instance, the fact that many particularly women, they're taking care of their kids, are homeless yet have jobs. And Georgina's mother had two jobs, but still struggling to find an apartment. Um, and I'm a human being. So I can imagine if I were a fifth grade girl and I was living in my car, um, how would I wash my hair? And where would I keep my things? And how would I do my homework? And all those things that I can think about and hopefully bring a degree of um, credibility to it. Um, so Georgina, um, unhappy, of course, living in her car. And one day she looks out the window and she sees um, a sign on a uh, telephone pole that offer a reward for a lost dog. It was $500 lost and it has a little dog. And she just like, wow, $500. And then she comes up with a scheme that maybe she can steal a dog and then she could, um, and when the owner posts the reward, she'll return the dog and collect the money, which we all know is a very bad idea. Um, the title of the book, How to Steal a Dog, there was some discussion at the publisher as to whether or not we should keep the title. Um, I stood my ground and I really wanted the title. And I'm glad that I did stand my ground because kids are very attracted to it. Um, I, I go to schools, many schools. I speak to hundreds of kids. I get lots of letters. Kids love characters that do naughty things. <laughs> you know, they love characters that make mistakes and they love characters that, um, lie and steal and curse and do all those things. <gasps> it's so much more interesting than kids that don't ever do anything wrong, right? Um, so they are very much attracted to the title. Um, so that brings us to the universal theme of making mistakes. And, you know, often I'll say to an auditorium full of kids, How, raise your hand if you've never made a mistake. Of course, there's always a couple of smart Alex who raise their hand, but of course we know everybody makes mistakes everybody makes bad choices and everybody does something wrong at some time or another in their lives. And I think kids really relate to that and because they've done things wrong, they've made mistakes, maybe they stole something, maybe they told a lie. Um, we've all done those kind of things. And I like to, it's, it's a great area of discussion with kids. I've had many, many great discussions with them, especially the fact that Georgina makes a decision to do something wrong for the right reason. And the reason being to get enough money to get an apartment. And then we discuss, okay, is it, does that make it less wrong if you're doing it for a noble reason? Um, most kids agree that it's, it's still wrong and you really shouldn't do it. And while Georgina had good intentions, uh, she made a very bad choice. And then I get to discuss with them the fact that maybe you make a bad choice, but then you make the choice to fix that mistake, um, which is what Georgina did. Uh, interesting anecdote, um, my editor for this book was um, Francis Foster, who was one of the greatest editors ever. Um, and the original version of the manuscript 
Um, Georgina is riddled with guilt, of course, right throughout the whole book. Um, she keeps a journal, by the way, How to Steal a Dog by Georgina Hayes, and she writes down all the steps, but her guilt is building and building and building to it gets the better of her. Um, in the original version, she decides she has to take the dog back. She takes the dog, dog's name is Willie. She takes the dog back, she opens the gate, she puts the dog in the yard, closes the gate and bolts out of there, which is what I would have done. <laughs> but Francis said, no, 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 no. She cannot do that. She has to own up to her mistake. She has to tell Camilla, Carmela, that's the owner of the dog, what she has done. And I was like, really? Francis said, yeah, she has to. So of course, and she was right, of course. And that's what Georgina reluctantly does. She goes back, she and ultimately sort of befriends the owner of the dog. And um, she has to tell Carmela that she is the one who stole Willie. Um, kids always love that scene too. Um, and it all, of course, worked out in the end. Um, so that's really the universal theme of how to steal a dog, making mistakes, making bad choices, but then making cho and choices to fix um, what you did. Um, there's also a, a, a theme of homelessness, the theme of poverty, the theme of broken families. I get many, many, many letters from teachers telling me I have so many kids who relate to Georgina and her situation and her family. And um, kids that have one, wonderful, nice families that are not broken um, can read the book and realize that not all families are like theirs. Some families are broken and some people do live in their cars. So um, I'm honored to have my book um, in the festival and I appreciate very much the honor. Thank you so much, Barbara. And of course, thank you for reminding all of us watching this, that stealing a dog is not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> not a good idea. So Mary Alice, really uh, take a couple of seconds just to talk about some of the choices that the children in your book make. Uh, well, I, I love that whole Barbara commented on all the different uh, things that, you know, things are go do go wrong and they do wrong things. And the children, well, there's some funny things. I think the, the common, one of the things the kids loved the most was um, jelly fish stings. We all have heard the old wives tales about what you're supposed to do. The kids particularly roar with laughter when Macon uh, gives the antidote. And I, the choices I think a lot of them is, is for family. The father was injured in the war and there's this really interesting um, dynamic between the father and son where they he, he doesn't know how to write talk to his dad. So he writes in his journal, he feels he can't write, but what he can do is write a letter about what's going on to his dad. So his journal and photograph of drawings become that bond between father and son. The grandmother is depressed. She's lost her, she's worried about her son and her husband's died recently. So you, you have that interesting dynamic between a grandmother. You don't say to the children, obviously, that grandmother's depressed, but you show through behavior she is, the mystery meat in the fridge. And the son and the grandson and the grandmother heal each other in the course of that summer. And in the second book, the father is back on the island and he's now learning how to use a prosthesis, which is an interesting um, question for a lot of kids. You know, they stare at it and don't know what it is. So the dynamic of, am I a fa good father? And is he still my father is, is a battle that they run through. Then there's the, um, just three kids from different economic backgrounds, um, challenging each other, testing each other. They, you, they steal a boat actually talking about stealing something. But there are, the consequences are always ones that pull them closer together because it's through our mistakes I wanted to show children that you become stronger. Well, thank you, Mary Alice. And like your books, um, you know, environmentalism is a great cause that, that we need to expose um, young readers to. But, mm -hmm. you know, also friends don't necessarily need to be human in order to make a good story. And we <laughs> see that in Manatee's Best Friend. So now let's take a moment to talk to Sylvia Liu about her book. Hi, yes, thank you so much. Um, and again, like everyone else, I'm thrilled and honored and thank the Virginia Center for Books for choosing my book, uh, Manatee's Best Friend. And um, I represent Virginia, but the book mostly takes place in, um, in Florida, actually, a place that I've um, been to many times in the last three decades. 
So um, basically, in Manatee's best friend, Becca Wong Walker is a 12-year-old girl who is super shy, um, and she's just happy to be friends with the manatees that show up at her backyard um, dock. But her world gets upended first when an, um, uh, um, sorry, an, um, an obnoxious girl moves in next door, and um, this girl ends up, um, she ends up throughout the course of the book, befriending this girl, Amelia, and another boy, Dion. So there is a friendship story where she eventually comes out of her shell um, to befriend these friends. But the bigger theme of the book is that she needs to overcome her extreme shyness to save her manatee friends from a variety of um, threats that they face, but most notably in her area, boat strikes. So the boats that come and strike the manatees. And um, the complicating factor, though, is that she takes a video of um, one of these manatees, and there's an interaction between a manatee and a dolphin that basically goes viral. And so because the video goes viral, there's a huge amount of attention put on her. And then to make things even more complicated, her father decides to um, capitalize on this attention and he starts bringing people to their home, um, sort of, you know, taking advantage of the interest. So she needs to battle sort of her shyness, the viral video fame, her, her dad, um, and all of this, eventually she finds her voice and ends up, um, you know, speaking up for them and pushing in her town for protections for the manatees. So um, I wrote the book because um, in part because I've been a lifelong environmentalist, I actually spent over a decade um, being an environmental lawyer, um, you know, filing lawsuits on behalf of marine um, creatures. Actually, I worked a lot in um, marine conservation and then the Endangered Species Act, um, coral reef protection and um, things like that. So it was a really, when I, um, when I transitioned from being an attorney to writing for children, um, my books tend to have an environmental theme. And so um, I really enjoyed writing Manatee's Best Friend. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Well, now let's take a moment and talk about imagination, dreaming big, and, and the people who inspire us. In several of the books, the main characters are inspired by libraries, by storytelling, and by overcoming adversity. Um, so let's talk a minute about the tradition of storytelling and how the stories of people of color can be celebrated and shared. Um, so why don't we bring Carol and Angela and Anika and Brianna back. So why don't we go ahead and start with Carol. You talked earlier a little bit about Matthew Henson, but let's talk about bringing the stories of these people of color back to the main stage of American history. Yes, um, you know, our stories have been so, um, or, our, or our impact and our influence has been so integral to the progress of this country, but yet our, you know, our voices have been marginalized, muted, and sometimes even muzzled. So it's very important now to give voice to those who came before us and, you know, to, to explore their histories and to um, just convey the kind of kind of courage and the kind of vision and the kind of creativity that we came from. So, and it's particularly important to reinforce that for young people um, and, and to, to put that forward to counter other narratives, racist, you know, racist narratives that still, you know, can persist. So, so that's, that's my, that's one way, that's one thing I think, you know, it's, it's very important to, to bring these stories forward. Um, so many people were unsung and so many contributions have been overlooked and it's, it's time to shed light on them. Hmm. Thank you so much, Carol. Very, very, very true. Anika, how about you? Well, I think bringing the stories of people of color was um, really what has legacy. Um, you talked about dreams hmm. and um, when I wrote the book, Planting Stories, I, the, the book really rests on a thematic metaphor of renewal and growth. And that all came out of a quote of hers where she said, 
I wish to be like Johnny Appleseed, who in the United States was known for planting apple seeds across the land. And so I wish to plant my story seeds across the land. That was her dream. Her dream was to take the folklore of Puerto Rico and share it with at least this country and, and beyond. Um, and her dream was for it not to get lost, right? So that, that idea that you have to keep it alive, you know, not just the oral tradition, but you have to write it down and you have to reach kids and you, or, or, it, or it, will, it will be lost. Um, and she understood that. So I think everything that she was doing feels so relevant now. And that's why I wanted people to know about her. Um, because it's like I was writing the story about the person who wanted to write stories. <laughs> I was writing the story about the woman of color who understood the importance of writing for kids of color and telling our stories, right? Um, I am constantly amazed at how many people say to me, I didn't know about Pura del Pre. I can't believe I didn't know about this famous librarian. How have I not heard of her before? And my book and others that have been written about her are. Um, a bridge and a, a first connection to, to this incredible uh, Boricua woman who everyone should know about, right? So, so I think for me that, that informs um, my wanting to write about these powerhouse Puerto Ricanas because you know, a lot of times people feel that uh, women of color especially are at the sidelines, not the center of history. And the truth is, we have always been at the center of history. We have always been pushing boundaries. We have always been creative and activists. Um, so, so I think it's just being out there and continuing to bring these stories to light um, and not doing what Pura did and, and, and not letting them get lost. Thank you, Anika. Angela? Yes, thank you so much. Both Carol and Anika uh, said many things that, that resonated, especially Carol. We need to have the, the counter the other narratives and Anika, oral tradition. Oral tradition often gets lost. I was producing a documentary about the fire burn and during the interview process, we, we, entered, we interviewed many people that had the oral uh, tradition. We also interviewed people who had actually taken a look at the archives and so they were a bit more uh, academic. And during that time, it was just a chance occurrence. Someone says, oh my gosh, this is so-and-so. He is actually from Denmark because during the, the time of the fire burn, current day US Virgin Islands was a Danish territory. And they said, why don't you ask him uh, about what he learned about the fire burn because of you know his Denmark or his Danish roots. And I said, absolutely. So this event that I had grown up hearing about that I spoke to a bit earlier that the laborers who were no longer enslaved were being treated poorly. Uh, they were being beaten. They were being raped, just horrible, horrible uh, work conditions. And finally, they had had enough and, and had this huge fire burn. The story that he grew up hearing and he repeated was that the only reason the fire burn happened is because when the laborers got paid, the men used all of their money to get drunk and lay in the ditches. And the women were so angry that they burned down half the island. And so through that, I, I understood that I have a nonprofit and a, we're, we're all about the uh, cultural preservation and our motto became our story, our voice. How do we go to the elders and we get these stories and we preserve them and we write them down, we put them in film, we have documentaries, we have books, because that was quite disturbing for me. Because on, it, it was just hard for me to imagine a planet that women would burn down an island because they were angry that their husbands got drunk. And so while none of us were there and the story, the actual story may be somewhere in between 
it was just so far-sighted that I understood the importance of, of capturing our oral tradition, of going into the archives and having them translated from Danish into English. And so I'm, I'm, I just echo the sentiments. We absolutely, we, we have to tell our stories and our voices so that they don't get lost. And I'd also like to circle back a, a bit about the, the, the story of the fire burn in that Martin Luther King said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And a huge theme in James and the fire burn is breaking that silence because the laborers, they were literally afraid of their life for their lives. They knew that if they complained, they would be beaten. They knew that nothing would change. And we see that with cyberbullying. We see it on the playground. We saw it in our family. One of my son's best friends stood by and watched him being bullied because he was afraid that he would be next. And so the one of the themes of James and the Fireburn is how do we safely break that silence? And when I go to schools, that's one of the things we talk about because it can be dangerous. But uh, yes, we need to tell our stories in our voices and continue the, the historical process, the, the legacy, uh, repeat the resilience of our people and let people know about our strength and history as well. Thank you so much, Angela. And over to you, Brianna. And you are of course working right now on, on a degree that concentrates about the representation of people of color in children's literature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my um, PhD looks at contemporary picture books and looks at representation specifically of Black children as food. And it's just kind of following the lines of questions, which basically ask, what does it mean for certain people to be on the table to be consumed and who is, who is eating those folks who are on the table to be consumed? Um, and I don't think it's as grotesque as I, I a lot of people feel when they usually are like kids getting eaten like literally and I'm like yes literally and literarily which I don't even know if that's a word but um you know PhD so we get to make up words and um, that's the whole reason why I started it um but um it's been really interesting writing I'm still writing picture books at the same time. I'm looking at picture books critically and kind of pulling out these different ideas to make sure that I'm not reiterating, you know, ideas that I'm critiquing. But with Impossible Moon, it was, uh, I think, a lot easier to just kind of write the story without thinking about the critical part of what I might be doing, um, just because some of what Angela said about what's being lost, who's being lost um, with some of our stories was really pertinent to um, Impossible Moon. When I was researching this book and I knew that I wanted to send a little black girl up into the stars because I had an AP physics teacher who told me that I would never be an astronomer. Um, and I decided I would find a way to get um, you know, myself to the stars or someone else. Um, and I did with Impossible Moon. Um, I spent a lot of time going to planetariums all around the U.S. And at these planetariums, with some of the planetarium shows, they would present Cassiopeia and the, mytholo the mythology around um, this constellation. And when they would take the constellation and create an image around the, the constellation, she was always presented as having long, fair hair, and she was white appearing. Um, Cassiopeia is in all of the mythologies that I have researched Ethiopian. And so I was just kind of like, what's happening? I'm sitting, you know, I've been to a lot of planetariums. Some of them have chairs. I went to one planetarium where they set out mats that you could kind of look like you were looking up at the stars. And I'm sitting there in all these spaces like saying no this is wrong but these are the images that become imprinted in the minds of families and children once they go when they go to these spaces especially when you're framing them within science 
which everyone is kind of taught to, you know, understand that science is science. You believe it because it's science. And so, you know, astronomy is science. Um, you know, planetariums typically are in science museums. So a lot of what I was doing and dreaming big about this little girl going to the moon was disrupting these ideas, not just of like how these constellations might exist um, to people who, you know, the truth needs to be told about who these people are, even though Cassiopeia didn't make it into the book. Um, but opening up to the ideas of like how these constellations could look if we are disrupting these images. So, you know, um, Orion has locks, long flowing rainbow colored locks in um, Impossible Moon. Um, Canis Major, which is the dog who is kind of whirling, you know, can create thunderstorms with their bark. Um, it's, that's an outside dog. And I always make, you know, it very clear when I'm talking to folks, this is an outside dog. And it's so funny because colloquially, you know, other Black folks get what I'm saying. You have inside dogs, you have outside dogs. That outside dog, don't bring that dog inside the house. <laughs> and so it's just building out these, the possibilities for what could exist. You know, the Gemini twins are wearing dashikis. So there was this hope that with this book, it's not just about place, you know, the celestial ascension and ideas above us in the heavens, but also about time and um, the immortality of our stories, whether they be oral narratives, whether we are privileged enough to have written um, narratives that exist for us, we are timeless. Our stories are timeless. Um, and I just think that the time hasn't been given to us in a lot of different spaces for these stories to be told in the ways that, you know, all of these fabulous authors that I'm sitting here with, like what a privilege, Carol Boston Weatherford, um, to be here. And I get to be here and my, you know, just as my grandma would say, oh, what a time. Um, so with me and the dreams that I have is to make sure that there's an evergreenness about the stories um, that I am able to put forward because my Auntie Anne, Colin, Ella Fitzgerald will never not be one of the best things I've ever heard in my whole entire life. And now that's a part of me and it's something that I'll share and that'll move forward. Um, yeah, I'll stop talking, timelessness. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brianna. Well. To close us out tonight, like many of you, I know that we all have a book that is very important to us or that reminds us of a particular moment in our lives. What book opened you up to a greater view of the world? And was there a special person that brought you and that book together? Why don't we go ahead and start uh, with Carol? I'm not going to choose the book. I'm going to choose the poem instead. Um, I'm going to say um, the poem I Too by Langston Hughes, which I was introduced to by my fourth grade teacher. I had read Langston Hughes before, but that was the first socially conscious poem of his that I read. The other poem was The Little Snail. So Langston Hughes was a, just a big influence on my, on my own poetry um, in terms of um, accessibility, um, lyricism, the melody, uh, you know, the beat. I, I, I love Langston Hughes and that I, I had, I was forced to memorize that poem in fourth grade. So you can, you, you can imagine that it made an impression on me uh, right in the midst of, of the civil rights movement. Wow. So that's it. Thank you so much, Carol. Barbara, why don't we go over to you? Okay. Um, I started my children's writing career about 30 years ago. And I started publish that my first published books were biographies for children because I was getting a lot of rejection letters for my fiction. So I reverted to nonfiction, um, but my heart was still longing to write fiction. Um, 
And I just couldn't figure out why I was getting all those rejection letters. It was so frustrating. And then one day I read um, Missing May by Cynthia Ryland. And it was literally like a light bulb just went off for me because I realized um, she wrote that book in particular, but many of her books, with a very strong sense of place. Uh, she grew up in the mountains of West Virginia, which is the setting um, of this book. And it, it just really spoke to me. And I could tell that she was writing um, from her about her heart's home. So that changed everything for me. And that's when I started writing books. Uh, all my books are set in the South because that's where I was a little girl. And that's what I know the best. And that's what I love the best. And that's what I feel the best, especially the Smoky Mountains. And I live in the Blue Ridge Mountains right now, um, which I consider my heart's home. So I, I wrote my first book, um, Beethoven in Paradise, with a Southern setting. And suddenly I found my voice. And I realized that prior to that, my writing had no voice. It was very generic. Um, you could pick up my book and it could be by anybody. And I wanted to have a distinct voice. Um, so Cynthia Ryland gets credit for that. Um, and my second book was called Me and Rupert Goody. And I said it um, here in the Blue Ridge Smoky Mountain area. And it really, um, I realized I had found the key to my success. And I thank Cynthia Ryland for that. And I literally sent her a copy of the book and I wrote her a letter and thanked her for being my inspiration and for, I called it continuing the chain of creative spirit, which she did for me. Um, and she wrote me back, handwritten. Uh, it was like getting a letter from a movie star. I was so excited. I still have it in my scrapbook. Um, and she was just lovely and complimented my book. So I always give her lots of credit for um, helping me find my voice, which helped me um, find my career and what I really love to do the best. So that's for Cynthia. Thank you, Barbara. Anika, how about you? Well, I gave mine away at the beginning, but, <laughs> but um, the person who was influential was my Fifi, Profi. And she was the first person to um, tell me I needed to have a library card in my own name. I was four or five, and I didn't even think that that was allowed. Like, I didn't know that little kids could have get library cards in their own name. And she marched me down. It was in, in New York City. Um, it was probably the Queensboro branch. <laughs> um, and, um, she had, you know, I spent a lot of time in the in the section with folk tales and fairy tales. And up until then, I had read a lot of, you know, Grimm's and the, the folk tales and the, and the fairy tales that I was learning in school. And she was the one that pointed me to Caribbean folk tales. And she's the one who put the book of, you probably can't see that it's blurry, Perez y Martina in my hand. Um, and it was the first time it was like a revelation because this was totally different kind of storytelling. Not only did it have Spanish in it and songs that I would remember her singing and I finally knew where they were from, but the structure and the language and the ending was so different than any of the, the fairy tales that I had, the disney fairy tales that I had learned and heard. Um, and I was captivated and I wanted to read more. And, you know, then I was reading about Anansi and all of these wonderful Caribbean folk tales and thought, this, these are the kind of stories that light me up. And I can draw a direct line to me wanting to tell stories that are different without predictable, nice, neat in a bow endings as an author to that moment. Um, and also just that putting that book into my hands as a little kid and telling me I need my own library card. Um, I understood like what a great privilege that was to have that book access. Um, and it was something that I, I never forgot. And that it was sort of a passport to all these, this kinds of storytelling that I wasn't getting in, in school. Um, and one last thing that I'll say that is I couldn't pick just one. So I had to think of, um, you know, I had to think of a book 
that was such a, a formative book when I was a child, but I would definitely say that later on, it would be when I was Puerto Rican, the autobiography by Esmeralda Santiago. Um, her, again, the voice, the setting, the storytelling, the form that I was finding just made me feel uh, so seen and, and just uh, made me love storytelling so much more. Um, I, I love other all kinds of storytelling, but there's a fundamental difference when it's something that you feel in your soul that comes from a place of how you've grown and the stories that you've heard from Abuela and Didi and you know all the people in your life that that it's it's a gift. So those are my two. Thank you so much, Anika. And you know, I probably am going to guess that most of the people speaking on the panel tonight spent countless hours in the 398.2s in their library looking at fairy tales and folklore. So, um, you know, it's definitely a Dewey call number well memorized by probably many of us here tonight. Let's go ahead and um, talk to Mary Alice about that. Well, I, I don't think it's any surprise for me that all the books that I read and loved as a child had something to do with nature from Heidi to Hatchet to Swiss Family Robinson. And then as I got older to Pat Conroy, who a great Southern writer and who was my friend, God rest his soul. And it was not though until 25 years ago when I was a volunteer for the sea turtle team by the Isle of Palms, Sullivan's Island. And I became really aware of the serious issues facing the coast in light disorientation. And I'd written five adult novels by that point. And I remember thinking, what can I do? I'm not a wonderful environmental lawyer like Sylvia Liu, hats off to you, or a biologist who was out there in the field. What, how could I use what I knew how to do to write books to, as a force for good? So I wrote, I wrote this book. It's different than any other book I had written. This is, it came out 21 years ago. It's, I, that's how kind of old I'm getting. And this book was unlike any I had written before. And the goal was, how can I use the power of story to inform readers about important environmental issues, in this case, the sea turtles, in a way that was interesting so they didn't feel like they were reading a nonfiction. And I, I changed the way I wrote. And I, this, was my, this was the novel, it was called The Beach House. It wasn't one of my fancy hardcovers. This is a little mass market that came out before social media. It was all word of mouth. And it was my first New York Times hit. And it greenlit. And of course, it's important to be on the list. It's good for your career. What was important to me was that it greenlit my ability to continue in this vein. And I've written books like that ever since. So this little mass market, I keep up on the shelf. To, for humble beginnings to remind me of why I love nature and I mean why I write what I do. So it's The Beach House, that's my favorite. That's the book when people say, what is your favorite book? <laughs> this one. Thank you so much, Mary Alice. Well, why don't we go ahead and just go over and, and talk about an environmental book that could be inspirational to Sylvia. Hi. Um, actually, un interesting and love the the books that I loved growing up were not environmental groups uh, on books. I, um, as you mentioned in the intro, I well, first of all, English wasn't my first language. It was Chinese until I went to school and preschool. So I sort of learned like English and storytelling probably through TV, Sesame Street. And my mom would take my sister and me to the library. But then when I was five, we moved to Caracas, Venezuela. And I lived there till I was 17, but I went to an American school. But um, the place I sort of fell in love with books was there was a little used bookstore run by um, expat, the, the expat community. So there were volunteers where people donated their books and then resold them to each other. And that's where I would spend my summers. And so I ended up reading a ton of books that were like very popular in the 70s and 80s. So a ton of Stephen King and Agatha Christie, so all adult books. But um, in terms of like the children's books that really like um, fired my imagination, I remember in third grade, my teacher, Mrs. Tokar is reading to us Charlotte's Web out loud. And that just completely captivated me. And then she did A Wrinkle in Time. So those two are sort of 
very seminal books. And then some other really um, classic, you know, where the red fern grows and um, like uh, the Chronicles of Pridden. And when I look back on it now, though, all those books are very like, you know, old white men, you know, very traditional fantasies. And I love them. They really like, you know, they opened a world of imagination to me. But as I started writing my books, I wanted to bring that same magic, that same fantasy or different, you know, worlds, but place the main character, you know, like make the main characters reflect my experience. So my main characters are all Chinese American, or in the case of a manatee's best friend, she's half Chinese and half white, which is like my kids. So, um, so I definitely wanted to, you know, bring in the same magic, but um, make it as relevant as possible to, you know, a wide variety of kids. So those are some of my, the stories that inspired me and now that it still influenced me. Thank you so much, Sylvia. It's so, so important to have that kind of representation in those stories as well. Angela, how about you? That was actually, Joe, the most difficult question for me to, to narrow it down and to think, you know, and I, I, I was going, oh man, it had to be the Bible. It's like, no, that's not what they meant. Oh, well, maybe it's, it's man's search for meaning. No, no. And I, and I thought about a, a children's book, The Velveteen Rabbit that it, it just moves me to tears. And I love the way the, the theme, I think mature themes are offered to children, uh, the acceptance regardless of appearance, the acceptance, the, the love, the vulnerability. And I love it because it inspires me to be truthful with kids. You don't need to dumb these subjects down to them present it to them in an appropriate manner, but it's important that kids are, are, are given uh, these themes of you know, non-judgment, accepting, loving. They, it doesn't matter what you look like. I, I just absolutely love that. So it, it's gotta be a velveteen rabbit. Thank you so much, Angela. And of course, we will close out with the great state of Georgia and Brianna McDaniel. <laughs> um so this was yeah Angela I agree it was a really hard question um and I have always been obsessed with uh, girls who fly in the night and so you have Tar Beach by uh Faith Ringgold and I was like yes and then in third grade um <laughs> I had a teacher her name was Ann Martin and I don't know if you all I, you know, I mean, you know, people will know the Babysitter's Club book, um, but the author's name is Ann Martin, Ann M. Martin, and I would just, some days I would just stare at Miss Martin and say, is she, like, could she, uh, but she was a great reader, and she gave me one uh, in the, the day before spring break for, or the Friday before spring break for third grade, um, she handed me a book a copy of um, A Wrinkle in Time that I still have. And um, I took that copy and I have continued to have that copy because I really felt like the character of Meg was a character that resonated with me, even though our experiences were so different. I very much felt like an outcast growing up um, and just felt like I didn't have a place. And then for her to be able to move in and out of time, move in and out of different spaces and even into outer space just felt um, phenomenal for me. Um, so I would say that A Wrinkle in Time and Ms. Martin were really important for my development. But um, even more than that was the first time I read The People Could Fly by Virginia Hamilton with illustrations by Leon Diane Dillon. And even though I don't think I realized the possibilities with that book at the very beginning, I realize now that she was probably the first historian and also the first author, the first historian of children's literature and the first author of children's literature that I was seeing like come together. Um, and what she did with that book by making sure to put at the end of the stories where these stories came from, 
um, and how people use these stories, if they use these stories, even the stories that kind of went different ways and maybe it was a type of storytelling that I wasn't used to because I was maybe used to something more linear. She taught me that children's stories and the way that we tell stories don't have to go a specific way. There's possibilities and those possibilities have come from people who have been here for much longer than I have. Um, and because of that, I'm a part of a legacy. And so I think Virginia Hamill taught me, Hamilton taught me legacy and my grandmother gave me that book. And I was probably too young to read some of the scarier stories like Taylor Poe, is that, was Taylor Poe in? Yeah, I think, but um, <laughs> she gave me that book and yeah, that one got ragged too, but I, I unfortunately lost that one. I still have my wrinkle in time. Thank you so much, Brianna. Well, you know, I have to agree with Angela and, you know, full disclosure, my favorite children's book is still Ferdinand about the bull who wanted to go against the grain instead of not fighting in the bull ring, sit on a hill and sniff flowers. So thank you all so very much for taking the time to talk to all of us. Of course, I'd like to thank all of the affiliate centers in region two East and all of the affiliate centers across our nation. Mm -hmm.